hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin in him, in Christ. And uh, boy, what, a, what a blessing it is to praise our Lord and Savior this morning because of what he's done for us. And we'd like to do that through this song at this time. Thank you very much, choir and orchestra. What a way to start our service this morning. We really appreciate that. We want to welcome you this morning, all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, and those of you who are visiting with us as guests. Thank you for choosing to be a part of our service this morning, and we really count that as an honor. And if you will look in the pew, uh, in the back of the pew in front of you, there's a little 
a pew holder there that has a, hopefully a, a guest card. Would you take a moment to fill that guest card out? You can either leave it on the pew uh, w uh, when you leave the service this morning, or you can meet us. We really would like to meet you over here in the information desk in the foyer. The staff will be there to, to uh, meet you. We want to get to thank you for being with us this morning, get to meet you personally. So would you keep that in mind? And we're going to uh, uh, go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Brother Sammy will be speaking uh, this morning, and I'm looking forward to that. We're going to be praying for him. Uh, but we have a few things that we want to remind you of in prayer. And uh, first of all, uh, we found out this morning that Pat Kelly fell at home there, and uh, she's not uh, feeling very well. We want to pray for Pat. And then we're very thankful that some have come through surgeries this week. Tricia Dutton uh, and Jason Whitaker both had knee surgery. We're praying for them. Nancy Owens had a heart catheterization that went very well. Uh, Tina Weathersby, we've been praying for her also. And so let's remember them. And then remember M Marie Pruitt. Of course, you know that her, Jerry, her husband, passed away. We want to continue to pray for Marie and her family. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, would you join me? Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you for the, the church, which you have purchased with your precious blood. It's not brick and mortar. It's not pews and all of that. It's the people you've redeemed by your precious blood. You look upon the church with great grace and favor, and we're very thankful. We're not worthy, but we're thankful for all the love you've bestowed upon us. Lord, thank you for our guests this morning. I pray that each one of them might sense a friendship and a friendly environment here, and also that they, uh, would, in hearing the message, they might be blessed by the word of God and the servant of God as he speaks, and the music and singing that we plan to worship you with. Lord, would you bless them. We thank, Lord, of the goodness of God towards those who had surgeries this week, the ones, the names that we've mentioned. Thank you for your goodness, Lord, toward each of them. And then we think of Marie and her family, Lord, and the sudden unexpected loss of uh, her husband. We think of them and pray for the family, but we pray specifically for Marie. And we thank you for the goodness that you've given her and the grace and peace you've given her in this very difficult time. Lord, we pray for Brother Sammy this morning that you would use him as a vessel to honor you. Guide him in the message. Guide Mark in the singing in our choir as we lift up our voices to your glory. Thank you for what you're going to do, Father. Thank you for the privilege of this beautiful Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know what? Uh, it's good to have some guests with us. I didn't get to every guest, but I know that Brother Rick McCauley has family from Arizona, Matthew and Ruth Formica. Thank you for being with us, Ruth and Matthew and your family. We appreciate that. Miss Donna Blue's here this morning. She, we prayed for her. She went through back surgery, and she's able to be here with her family today. Thank you, Donna. It's good to see you. And all of you that were guests, thank you for being with us. Do want to make a couple of announcements? Then CW is coming to finish up the announcements. But uh, first of all, I want to remind you about what we've called Life Sunday, Easter Sunday, March 31st. Uh, we have baskets out here in the foyer on tables. These are called life baskets or gift baskets, and, and they are for you to take with you uh, to use to pass out to families and people maybe that you don't even know, but you just want to reach out to them and give them an invitation for Easter Sunday. We're praying for 200 visitors and guests on that Sunday morning. And those baskets are a way to reach out, have something to give them, and invite them to our services. Take one with you. Take several if you would like to. And a suggestion was made. Well, how do you give these out? Well, you can give them to your friends, co-workers, but you could also... Just be in the parking lot at Walmart and meet a family. Take a basket to them. Say, listen, we're inviting you to be with us on Easter Sunday. Folks, God will bless it. I promise you the Lord will bless it. And so would you consider taking a basket? It's coming up quick, March 31st. 
And then on that Sunday, we got some special things planned. Uh, Sunday school will take place at 9.15. But following that, following Sunday school, we're going to plan for a light, that's light, L-I-G-H-T, -I light Easter breakfast. And we're asking each family if you would bring some kind of a sweet breakfast sweet treat to put together for our guests and for our church family. And we're going to have a time of breakfast fellowship together. That will be immediately following Sunday school leading up to the 1030 Easter Sunday worship service. And we don't plan to have evening service that night, so keep that in mind. But that's for Easter Sunday. I've been asked to mention, too, planning to have guests that Sunday and preparing for them on that uh, Easter Sunday. We want to make parking available for them. It would be if they were a guest and there was no parking, that would be certainly inconvenient and not very well planned. So we're asking those who are able, uh, if you would be on that Sunday morning, if you would park down here at the end of the building on the grass area, we've done that before, that end of the building, the playground end of the building, park on the grass. Hopefully the weather will permit that not to be a, a bad situation, but that's what we're working toward. There will be some parking lot attendants there possibly to help help in that too. Now, we're not talking about if you can't, are not able to park there, you park where you'd like to, but we want to make as many parking spaces available for guests. And then, immediately following the service this morning, Mike Allen, who heads up our security team, needs to meet with the security team men and women in the fellowship center immediately following the service. He'll be right there uh, waiting for you, so if you'll keep that in mind. Thank you, Brother C. Good morning. How many of you have received an invitation to Life Sunday at Yates Thacker Baptist Church in the mail? Anybody? Sounds fun. I think I might come to it. How about you? I'm looking forward to that day. Um, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's more, more than sweets and more than balloons. But as a Christian, we have something to celebrate and we're going to celebrate it that day. Uh, I just want to let you know that Brother Joey Bird will be speaking next Sunday morning. Uh, I always anticipate hearing him speak. I'm looking forward to hearing him speak next week. And then uh, I want, also want to let you know next Saturday, March 23rd, I don't think Pastor mentioned this already, but there is a memorial service for Brother Jerry Pruitt here at 2 o'clock at our church. Also, I'd like to ask you to continue to pray for our three-on-three -three basketball tournament on April 20th. That will be held at Sand Hills Classical Christian School. And if you have any questions on that, I'll be glad to answer. This is an outreach event. We'd love to have as many young men and women as we possibly can. It's 11 years old to 19 years old, so we'll be playing basketball all day. Mike Washer, you've, you've heard him before with National Hoops. He'll be presenting the gospel to those young people. And you're welcome just to come hang out and have a good time that day as well. We do have some good news, uh, however. That's always a, a blessing to, to mention. We have two births I want to mention. Uh, Rod and Marsha's daughter, Cassie, and her husband, Hans, had, have a newborn baby girl. Her name is Peyton Sage uh, Bauman. It's 7 pounds, 8 ounces, born March 8th, and they're, they're all doing well. And then uh, Michael and Connie Bachman are the grandparents of a newborn baby boy. And Josiah and Katie are the new parents. And the baby's name is Britt Coulter Gargas. And the baby was born on March 14th, 7 pounds, 13 ounces. This is also Brother Rob's uh, first great-grandchild, if I'm not mistaken. So he's also uh, double happy for that. I do have one card I'd like to uh, read to you. This is from Charlie and Cynthia Cooper. And they write, We send our sincere thanks to you for all you did during my sickness and surgery. It's been a long process, and though I am on the mend, I still have a ways to go. The cards, calls, visits, and the meals were so much appreciated. Most of all, knowing you were praying sustained me in some dark times. With love and thankfulness for your faithfulness, Charlie and Cynthia Cooper. Amen. When he said, Brother Rob's uh, first great-grandchild, uh, my heart said hallelujah. Uh, I like that thought, like that idea. Uh, can you say the word hallelujah this morning? Let me hear you say it. Say it with me. 
Hallelujah. Amen. Well, there's no better word, I don't know, well, there may be a better word, but no more this morning than we want to say hallelujah. So when we sing these words, hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And a great, great doctrinal hymn. And we're going to begin our sing time with that this morning. If you'll stand, please. We'll sing right through this. You digest these words as we sing this morning. Man.
probably, but you know what? I think it's music to our Lord's ears. I really do. And uh, he appreciates your worship to him. You know, just because we're saved, just because we know Christ and, and we're born again does not mean that we have given him everything. It's a decision. And I don't believe it's one decision. I believe it's many times that we have to surrender to the Lord. This world, Romans 12, 2, tells us it's trying to conform us. And so it takes a regular surrendering of our hearts and our commitment to Christ. And I pray that you'll sing this song this morning, not as an invitation necessarily, but a surrendering song for us today, to be honest with the Lord. Let's sing together, I surrender all. Pastor Sammy sings this song, okay? So when we do that, we'll have someone in the back that'll be ready and waiting for you to help you find your child to the, the area and the ministry that they need to go to. Thank you for singing. Thank you for that wonderful singing and what wonderful messages we've sung today. And a special welcome from me to you. Thank you for being here to worship the Lord with us, especially if you're here as a guest. And um, Patty, it looks like you've got some special friends here with you. Who do you have here? Who? 
From where? Did you hear that? I'm not going to try to repeat it because I'll... I'll... Oh, okay. <laughs> Betty, maybe you better say it a little bit louder. Colorado Springs. Okay, Colorado Springs. Now I have it. Now I've got it. I'm with you, okay? Folks, thank you for joining us, okay? We're so thrilled to have you, so thrilled you're here. Also thrilled to have Brad Ragsdale back with us with his special friend, who is our special friend after many, many months, and David and Joan back together. Oh, praise the Lord. What a blessing. I do want to ask you to pray this morning for little Liam. This is Seth Campbell and Allie's son. They had, he hit his head last night, and boys will be boys, but he's throwing up this morning, and they're headed to the doctors as we speak this morning, so please pray for little Liam. We'd appreciate that. Well, as we begin this morning, we're going to do a song. We're going to do something we've never done before. Jeremy, I'm ready if you are. Many, many years ago, I was privileged to write a song with a broken heart. It's called Harvest. And um, about 1 o'clock in the morning, thinking about um, broken, hurting people in our county and in our state and in our world today and children, so many who are suffering. And it just was heartbreaking to me. The outworking of that was a man ministry for eight years. Many here involved in that, picking up precious young people who were coming from homes and from hurt and heartache. John 4:35, we read, Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Rescue the perishing. I surrender all. Hallelujah. I pray today that God will work in all our hearts and touch us in a unique way to see the need around us and to understand that we who know Christ have the answer for the cancer of the heart, for the AIDS of the heart. And only the Lord can bring forth beauty from ashes, but he is able to do that. Our part is to pray, our part is to witness, and we're trying to do that here as a church corporally, and I trust as individuals as well. But before I sing, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the privilege today to be here together with these precious folks. Thank you for the guests that have come from places. Thank you for bringing Brad back here after so many months of, of challenging physical issues and, and needs and for David and Joan as well, and this dear family from Colorado, and, and uh, Rick's family as well. What a blessing, Lord. What a blessing. And Lord, as we come today, we do want to lift up little Liam to you and Seth and Allie. I know that's a concern. And we just pray for your grace there as they're trying to do their best to take care of his physical needs. And we pray for them. Thank you for their faithfulness to each other, to the, to the work of the Lord, to the service of the Lord here. And today as we come, Lord, we pray you'd give us your heart today, that we would see something that we haven't seen before. But most of all, that we would see you. You said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto, unto myself. So I pray today that you'll give me the grace to lift you up, to hold you high. Brother Mark has done that in the songs we've sung and with the choir and the accompaniment there, and we're grateful. But today I pray, Lord, you'd give us a broken heart for the needs all around us. We live in a hurting world. We live in a world full of lost people. Many of those lost people are members of our family that we've been praying for for a long time. We pray that you'd use us, you, that you'd give us a greater vision, a greater burden, that we would reach out out of our comfort zones to try to reach into the hearts and lives of those who are so desperately lost and so desperately needy. So today, I pray this song will be a part of that, and your word will do what only your word can do to, through the power of your spirit. I acknowledge as always, that without you, I can do nothing. Please use me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Far too many children crying. That's sad, I can tell. Far too many families not doing very well. Times are tough for mom and dad. Tears they fall like rain. Too many times the innocent are living life in silent pain. Far too many handsome heroes, posters you can buy. Looking on the outside, 
like they're really doing fine. Living on appearances, making wrong seem right. Have they not yet heard the seeds they sow? They will reap one day in time. Fields are wide unto the harvest. Workers few and hard to find. Fields are wide unto the harvest. Workers few and hard to find. Far too many forgotten people locked up doing time. Growing old in some lonely prison, out of sight and out of mind. With no hope for tomorrow, and misery today. Asking whatever happened, what have I missed somewhere along the way? Far too many precious people lost and gone astray glassy eyes and suicide more common every day memories so painful that the hurt won't go away how can we who believe and see such need turn our heads and walk away Fields are wide unto the harvest. The workers few and hard to find. Fields are wide unto the harvest. Workers few and hard to find. Workers are but Turn your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 5. I want to say a special thank you to all the children's workers, and I encourage you to let them know how much you appreciate them when you go back and pick up your kids. I'll say a special thank you to those who are serving in the nursery today and every day, and for those that come when you're not here and no one's here to clean and prepare and, and do all that needs to be done to make sure that's a safe, clean environment. Thank you, thank you. Sound guys, thank you for working with me this morning, for doing something a little bit out of the box there. I appreciate it so much. You know, uh, someone asked me this morning, Brother Lamar said, are we finished with the marriage series? Well, yeah, I don't know if we started down that, continued that path, we'd ever get finished, would we? I mean, there's finances, there's intimacy, there's this, there's that, the, the other fruit of the Spirit that we didn't get to. But one thing I will say, we spoke about love last week, and I neglected to mention one of my heroes and one of the most loving people in this congregation and here today. And that person is my dear friend, Daniel Hall. Daniel, every Sunday, he's waving. Stand up, will you, Daniel? I want to honor you this morning. This is Daniel, and there's not a Sunday when he's here, and I don't walk by him, and here's what I see, and here's what I hear. I love you, Sammy. You see that? Daniel, I love you. Thank you. Let's give Daniel a hand. How about that, all right? One of the most loving men that I have ever met in my life, and I'm so grateful for the encouragement he is to my life. We're in Luke chapter 5, and 10 years ago or so, maybe longer, I preached this message. It's going to be a little bit different today, but the points are the same. But I thought it might be a good thing to revisit this, particularly with our theme of be a missionary, particularly with our heart to try to reach outside of ourselves into our community this coming Easter. And we're thankful for that outreach ministry so very, very much. So we're in Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him, 
that being Christ, to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for drought. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were on the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the drought or drought of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. They forsook all and followed him. I wonder how many of you here love to fish. Anybody here love to fish? How many of you love to eat fish? We probably have a few more hands there. How many of you have ever been fishing and gotten a fish hook stuck in your hand or part of your body? Anybody like that? How many of you have ever hooked somebody else who was in the boat or on the bank with you? Boy, wasn't that a happy day, right? And I did that one time, one week apart, seven days apart. I did it this day, did it this day, twice. Boy, that was something to write home about, I'll tell you that. What did you do? Did you cut the hook and push it through? No, I went to the doctor. I don't like pain. That's what I did. I'll tell you that. But you know, when I think about fishing, I think about my great, my grandmother, Grandma Calloway. Boy, did she love to fish. I'm telling you, she would take a cane pole and she would take a bucket of minnows and she would sit for eight hours in one spot and fish. If I ever sat in one spot and fished for eight hours, go ahead and call the funeral home because I'm gone, okay? But she would do that, and she loved it. And what she would do, when we, we would come, we'd fish just a little bit, but boys being boys, we'd get bored to death, and we'd start running around, and she would always say, boys, be right easy now, be right easy. If you fall in that water, I'm coming in there after you, and I can't swim, and you can't swim, and we all going to drown, okay? That was Grandma Calloway. Boy, did she love to fish. But the text before us does remind me of Grandma because there's fishing involved. The setting is the Sea of Galilee. The Lord Jesus is there. There's a crowd of people there. And some of the disciples or would-to-be disciples are there and and some waiting fish. You know, fishing takes faith. It takes determination. It takes patience. It takes preparation. It takes teamwork, especially if you're net fishing. Chris, good to see you, brother. Good to see you. And... um, but as we look at this, the question, um, a matter of fact, matter of fact, two days ago, Sandra and I went for a walk at some property that, that's my, my dad's property, really, and there was a guy fishing, a friend of mine fishing in the pond there, and he was talking about fishing. When we came back by, guess what he had to show us? Pictures, okay? Had to show us the pictures. Any of y'all have pictures of fish you've caught? And I asked him, I said, what did you do with that fish? We threw it back. My first thought was, what a shame that is, Okay. I don't understand that, but that's what real fishermen do, I'm told. So I must not be a real fisherman, but uh, I do like to eat them. But as we look at this and think about this question and, and that I'm going to ask you, the question is this, not are you a fisher of fish, but are you and I fishers of men and women and boys and girls? Are we, do we consider ourselves missionaries to souls? Do we, have we, in our experience of our Christian journey of faith, do we have any trophies of grace? Have you ever had an opportunity to lead someone to Jesus Christ? Have you ever had the privilege of seeing a new baby born into the family of God? Friends, there is nothing like it. And that's what I want to talk about today. What is the character of a person who is a missionary, be a missionary or fisher of men, women, boys, and girls? I believe this, the Lord's desire is that for every believer that we would fear not, forsake all, and follow him. And I like what Brother Mark said a few moments ago about surrender. 
It's a daily surrender. It's multiple times through the day. It's a yieldingness to God. Yes, there's an aorist tense, once and for all, here am I, I'm all in. But then it has to be followed up with daily surrender to the Lord. The Bible says, and Jesus said, He saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. If I want to be, and if you want to be a fisher of men, we must follow Christ. Well, how does that work? We have to stay close to him. I was hunting in Iowa, and it was the early morning. It was dark, 30. I mean, it was dark. And my friend Tim Chase, I'm walking behind him. I probably told you this before. He said, Sam, he stopped. He said, Sammy, pick up your feet. You sound like a horse walking through the woods. Pick up your feet. But I was holding on to his coat. It was so dark. He, I, he wouldn't talk other than to tell me to, to do better. But I held on to his coat. That's how dark it was. But if I'm going to follow Christ, if I'm going to be a fisherman, I've got to hold on to his heart. And I've got to have his heart. He has to have my heart. That means the word of God is non-negotiable for my life. I need to abide in him, to spend time with him in fellowship. I need, and I commend you for being here today, I need to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. I desire, I need to pray, I need to humble myself and acknowledge how desperately needy and dependent I am. The staff met this morning and we prayed together and Pastor prayed. It was so precious about how dependent we are upon him. And we all are. Sometimes we forget that. But what are these four characteristics? Number one, fishers of men are available. The Bible says in our text, the people pressed upon him. And he sat down and taught the people. He didn't run away from them. He didn't, and he got into a boat, not to get away from the people, but so he could better minister to them. Hey, what are your thoughts regarding people? Now, let's think about something in Moore County these days. What are your thoughts regarding people when you're trying to get from point A to point B in Moore County these days? Highway 5 can be challenging. The traffic circle can be challenging. Is your thought, bless the Lord, he's bringing the mission field to us? Or is it, why didn't they stay home? Why are they coming here and we can't get anywhere quickly anymore? We just have to spend more time, more opportunity to memorize Scripture in the car and listen to Bible preaching and listen to good godly music, right? But how do you feel about people? Well, you know what? The best of men are men at best. And people are people. And sometimes we need to be alone and away from people. Can I get an amen on that one right there? Okay? Some of you are afraid to say it because you're sitting beside a people. Okay? I understand that. Jesus was available publicly and privately. Whether people were coming through the door or coming through the roof, whether it was a religious leader with questions coming at night or, or a woman sitting by a well in the middle of the day who'd been married five times and was living with a man, Whatever the case, he was always available. Even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Like Jesus, fishers of men must be available. Jesus was available all the time. And the ultimate availability was when he hung on the cross with arms outstretched, as if to say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What a Savior. But in our text, he, he singles someone out. His name is Simon, later Peter. And you know what? Wouldn't it be wonderful today for God to single somebody out here? You, or you, or you, or you, and speak to you in a way in which he's never spoken before. Or maybe he has, and we haven't heard and haven't responded. Will you respond to him? If you're convinced that he's speaking to you, will you, will I respond to him? Have you ever declared your availability to him? Wherever, whenever, whatever. Whatever that means, whatever it takes, here my Lord, I'm all in for you and with you. When Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, he was speaking of the giving of those in Macedonia, and he said this, and this they did, not as we hoped, but listen to these words, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. 
You know, isn't it interesting? We used to pass an offering plate, and uh, now we've got the boxes out there. But isn't it interesting to consider that more than what you put in the plate, what Jesus wants is you and me in the plate. Now, you say, that would look so foolish. Well, to the world, to carnal Christians, yes. But to Jesus, it would be a gift, a wonderful gift. He gave himself for us. He invites us to give ourselves to him, to give their own selves to the Lord. I don't know about you, but sometimes I struggle with this part. I remember one night going, getting ready to go to a football game as a youth pastor. It was a, I think it was a JV game, but I'm getting ready to walk out the door, and there's a knock on my front door. And I open the door, and there's a friend who's now, I don't know if he's in heaven or not, but we really tried to reach him every way we could, my brother and me. And he's there, and it's obviously he's a bit inebriated. He's not, he's not real steady and um, like this. And I opened the door, and he said, what are you doing? Where are you going? I said, well, I'm getting ready to go to a football game. He said, can I go? Oh, I'm thinking, hmm. You pastor the 8th Lager Baptist Church, he can't hardly stand, much less walk. And then he says, I'll drive. I said, no, you won't. <laughs> no, you won't. So I, I said, okay. So we go out, we get in, in my truck, and we head to the game. The whole time, I'm concerned with his soul and his, his eternal well-being. And Nope. I'm concerned with one thing. I'm concerned with one person. Me. My reputation. What are people going to say? What are people going to think? We get to the game, and I literally have to help him. There's a long walkway at Union Pines. Many of you know what I'm talking about. And we're going down, and, and he's struggling. And halfway down, he, he, he stops. And I said, come on, let's go. He said, no, wait. And he starts waving and yelling at a couple. And I see the couple he's yelling at. And they visited Yates Thayer Baptist Church the very Sunday before. And I take him to the bottom. He makes a beeline to them. I said, if he falls, he's on his own. I said, I got to go get a drink, a Coke, okay? I got to get a Coke. So I go to the coat counter, and he's over there talking to them. He's waving his arms, pointing at me. Just, I'm just dying inside. I'm so concerned for No, so concerned for me. And I'm standing there drinking that coat. And I did not hear an audible voice. But friends, I heard a voice in my heart. Look at you, Mr. Youth Pastor. Oh, you can preach it. But you're not living it. I made myself of no reputation. That's all you're consumed and concerned about right now. You're not available unless it's a benefit to you. And God smote my heart, and I confessed my sin right on the spot. Went over to him, got him. Come on, let's get a, let's get a Coke and some popcorn. We went up. He was the loudest one in the stands. <laughs> he was something, but it didn't matter anymore. He came home with us, with me. Spent the night, woke me up the next morning coughing, hacking. He really had a problem. Later that day, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, a knock came on the door again. Guess who it was? It was him. I said, hey, man, he was sober. He said, man, I just want to stop by and tell you how much fun I had last night. That is the most fun I've had in a long time. And I said, I, in my, my mind, I'm thinking, let's don't bring that up. Please, let's don't bring that up. <laughs> Not the fun part, not the joy it was to him, but the sinful part in my life. I mean, I was there, but I wasn't in my heart available until God dealt with me. Are you available? Fishers of men are available. Fishers of men are also obedient. Jesus had a simple request for Simon Peter. He asked him to put out your boat a little bit from the land so Jesus could get in it. And preach. No problem there. That's easy. But then in verse 4 we read, He said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a, dry, a draught. Which means a catch or a haul of fish. But wait a minute. Verse 2 says they were washing their nets. They were good stewards. They were putting away their tools. Cleaning off the tables. Going home. I'm thinking of a waiter. As a waiter I, I, I used to remember right at 5 till closing time somebody would always come in. And I wasn't available in my heart. I wanted to get home, get cleaned up, and get out of there. But they were finished. And Jesus said, let's go back to work. They've been fishing all night. That's what the Bible tells us. They had toiled all night. They had worked hard. They were exhausted. They had not caught a single fish, not even one. And it was a foolish request from a professional fish, fisherman's standpoint. Look, you're a carpenter. I'm the fisherman. 
We don't fish this way. We fish at night in shallow water, not in the daytime in deep water. By the way, there are a crowd watching here, nothing like failing with an audience, nothing like that. This is impossible. Jesus, look, this is a waste of time. But, but Simon obeyed partially. And I think he obeyed with a sigh. Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. That's plural, right? What did Simon do? Master, we have toiled all the night and taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Net. Why did Simon do that? Well, Jesus gives us the answer, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus had asked him to do something. It didn't make any sense to him. I can't help but think about Philip preaching in Samaria, and he sends him out to a deserted road to meet with an Ethiopian unit in, in a desert setting. One person. Leave the crowd. Leave the revival. Leave the glorious fruit being, being taken, taking place in this place. And go to a deserted place. He immediately obeyed God. Philip, or Simon, Peter, excuse me, obeyed. And what happened? A couple of things significantly happened. He said, I will let down the nets. Personally, he obeyed. But look what happened in verse 6. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. Isn't it interesting? When one person stands up for Jesus, when one person is willing to obey Jesus, oftentimes others who are watching will follow. You know what? You could be that one person. You could be that one person in the youth group. You could be that one person in, in the adult class. You could be that one person in the couples class. You could be the one person in the junior class. You could be that one who says, I am going to follow Jesus, whatever it costs, whatever the consequences, I'm going to be the one. You could be that one in the workplace. I had a membership meeting with a young lady this morning, sharing with her what it was like working in a corporation when they would have happy hour. Come on, Sammy, let's go to happy hour. I said, no, thank you. Why won't you come? I'm happy. But after happy hour, then it was dinner, then it was a meeting, then they weren't happy enough, so they went to another happy hour at another club. And Sammy said no. Because Sammy had said yes. And I don't, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back. I'm saying this to say God had worked in my heart that I wanted to please him more than I wanted to please them. Whatever it might mean, whatever it might cost. There were some difficult times, difficult days. But is it worth it? I believe it's worth it. But you have to decide for you in your setting. You know, I see the power of Christ. He's the Lord over creation. Incredible results. The nets were full. They began to break. The net was full. It began to break. And I can't help but think about the poor fish. You know, the Mac Daddy fish says, Okay, boys, follow me. The master calleth. And they go into the net, but it's crowded because there's supposed to be nets, plural. Can you imagine the, the, the fish talking to each other? If fish could talk, man, get your fin out of my eye. It's not my fault. That guy only, there's supposed to be multiple nets here. Only, there's only one. It's crowded. I understand that. You say, you are crazy. Thank you very much. Partial obedience can be blessed, but not like full obedience. They were astonished at what happened because fishers of men are available, friends, and fishers of men are obedient. Lord, if that's what you say, that's what I'm going to do. But you know what else? Fishers of men are humble. Hey, how you doing right now? Could we have an invitation, invitation now for somebody? And you would know you should and could respond. But fishers of men are also humble. John Fry, if you'll come on up, please. I asked my brother to share something during this time. Listen, friends, it takes humility to submit to Jesus Christ in salvation. It takes humility to submit to Christ in surrender. It takes humility to spend time in prayer and spend time with the Word of God. And this is one of my dearest friends and with a precious testimony. Brother John, thank you for being willing. I love you, man. I'm willing, yes. Uh, Brother Sammy called me yesterday. I guess the good news was about that was I didn't have long to worry about this and what I might say. But um, my story... Uh, I'm going to give you the short version of it today. Grew up in a Christian family here locally, a Christian home, Christian family, was taken to church from a young age, made a decision for Christ at a very young age, four or five years later was baptized, joined the church, was always in church, went to a Christian school, uh, first year of college spent in a Bible college. Um, 
But you know, all through those teen years and college years, I was living life my way and doing things my way. And it was three steps forward and two steps back, mistakes, um, emptiness. And uh, my personality type wants to achieve things. My daughter's into this Enneagram thing, and she was telling me, you're a, you're a this, you're a three or whatever, and it's all about achievement. And, you know, I kind of looked at my life, and I was checking things off. If I could just learn to drive, if I could just uh, get out of my home, if I could be married, if I could build our own home, uh, if I could have children and check these things off, career, achievements, whatever it is. And uh, it was emptiness after emptiness after emptiness. And I kind of come to a point in my life where I was in church, I was serving in church, but I don't know that church was in me. And I heard a testimony at the men's golf tournament, Brother Larry Shaver, I don't know if he's here today, I think he was greeting, and he told how he was saved while serving in the church as a young adult. And I thought, wow, that, that kind of, maybe that's what I am. And um, over a period of that following year, I began to examine myself, you know, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, Examine yourselves. Don't you even know your own selves? Whether you be in the faith. And um, I began a journey for me over a period of about a year, examining myself, questioning myself, doubting my salvation. Lots of things going on there. Studying the word. Uh, I sat under Brother Sammy in the youth group, where I was an assistant in the youth group. And he started a series of the 15 assurances of salvation. And he would teach one a week, and I'd go, well, nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. Well, maybe that one, I'm not sure. One after the other began to, through God's word, reveal to me that maybe I was not in the faith. And it all culminated about a year later as I cried out to God and said, Lord, reveal to me. Let me know. Examine yourselves. I said, Father, will you let me know if I'm in the faith or not? And it culminated with one night on a Sunday night, I asked Sammy to meet with me at night in the church, and we met in his old office over there, and I thought, later, I, as I look back on that, I think, hmm, sounds a lot like Nicodemus, and I've shared that at the cross during our live nativity. Uh, the religious person who comes to God by night with questions, seeking, but looking for answers, and I humbled myself and, and realized that I had a need for true salvation and I received Christ, was baptized into church as an adult, someone serving in church. And yes, there were those questions. What are people going to think? What are people going to think of me? You know, your pride and all those things welled up. But um, thank God uh, that God reached, you know, Jesus reached down to the prostitutes. He reached down to the prisons. But he also reached out to the religious people. He reached out to the rich young rulers. He reached out to all kinds of people. He loves us all and cares about us all. And you know, deep down, we're we're all the same anyway, but, um, you know, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, you know, they that come to God must believe that he is and believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And uh, that was me. I was diligently seeking him. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you are unsure. Maybe you've been in church all your life. Maybe you've been around Christian things. Maybe you know all the Christian terms and all those things, but um, maybe it's not inside you. And only you can know that, right? And um, our prayer for you today is if that's you, uh, Sammy said, hey, would you just share your story? And I said, sure, I'm happy to do that. And um, I hope it helps someone here today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brother John. Fishers of men are available, and John was available. Fishers of men are obedient. He was obedient to the cross. You know what? Jesus Christ was available. As he knelt there in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus Christ was obedient. My meat, he said, is to do the will of my Father which hath sent me. Are you available? Are you obedient? Why did I want John to share? Because I believe there are people here today or perhaps people watching online who have a form of godliness, but they've never taken that step of faith and turned from their sin and received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. How does that work? What does that look like? It's simple. John had to humble himself, singing in the choir, serving 
in youth ministry. One of the finest men that I know or have known, but had a need. He knew, nobody else knew. And John had to come to a place where he admitted to God that he was a sinner and that it, his goodness was not good enough. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He was a member of the church. He had been baptized. But that doesn't save anyone, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he, has, he hath saved us. So he had to come to a place where he personally, personally, had to turn, believe, and trust Jesus Christ as his Savior. The Bible says it simply, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What an amazing reaction we see in this text with Peter. He was astonished. He was amazed. He was humble. He fell on his face before God, the Bible says. He was prostrate before this God. He realized in that moment, in his bewildered amazement, and that's what the word astonished means, that he had been in the presence and was in the presence of God in the flesh and had seen him perform an incredible miracle, something he had never seen before. That was just the beginning. Later, the Lord Jesus says to those three businessmen, did you hear me? Businessmen, Peter, James, and John, fear not. Follow me and forsake all. You know, I always had a fear of following Christ. Number one, I knew I couldn't live that way. Number two, I wasn't sure I could, that I wanted to live that way. Number three, I was concerned about what people would think and about what people would say. Well, you know, when these men decided to follow Christ and go all the way, God opened up the windows of heaven. Can you imagine what they were able to experience with Christ? The things that they saw when he walked on water. The people that were healed of infirmities. The dead raised back to life. Being able to be face to face with God day after day after day after day. What a joy. What an opportunity. Yes, they were persecuted. Yes, they suffered. Yes, they died for their faith. But the question is, is it worth it? I have two more points, but I'm going to close. At another time, we'll finish them. I'm just burdened for you. There were hands raised last, night, last week in this service. I only got to talk to one person. In the last few weeks, we've seen someone receive Christ as Savior, but today, the question is, having heard what you heard from Brother John, do you have genuine faith? Do you have Jesus Christ is your Savior, and that's settled. I didn't ask you if you're a member of a church. I didn't ask you if you have served in this church or in another church. I didn't ask you if you've been baptized. My question is, do you know that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, from the youngest here to the oldest? I've said this before. I'll say it again. A hundred years from today, what we're talking about right now, friends, is going to be the most important issue in your life and mine. And if you're here, and we did talk about being available, and you know that you know Christ, that's settled for you. Have you given your life to him? And if you're here, and you know that you know Christ, have you chosen to obey him? Maybe it's an issue of baptism, or church membership, or maybe it's an issue of a place to serve, or maybe there's some things we need to say no to, some doors in our heart we need to close and walk away from, and maybe even some relationships we need to put some distance between. But the question this morning, do you know Christ? Do you know him? Because the, when you know him, and the more you grow and get, get to know him better, the more you're going to love him. And the more you love him, the more you're going to want to serve him. And the more you serve him, the more you love him. And the more you love him, the more you want to obey him. And it's just a wonderful journey of sweet fellowship with Christ when we are willing to be available when we are willing to obey, because he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, Jesus said. Do you know him? Do you love him? Zach, I'd like you to come. Jamie, I would like you to come.
Yep, I want you to come. Please. I want us to sing. Brother Mark, I want you to come. And I want to sing the chorus of I Surrender On. I want you to watch Jamie do signs as we do this chorus. I saw you doing it out there, Jamie. I did not call her and prepare her. Jamie, you stopped short of the platform. Come on up. All right, come on up. We're going to sing together I Surrender All, and then we're going to ask God to give an invitation. Ready, Brother Mark? 278 if you need it, okay? You ready, Miss Jamie? Wait just a second. Let's do the first verse in the course. give me the honor of praying for you if you're here today and your salvation is a question mark and not an exclamation mark. If there's any measure of doubt, would you please allow me the privilege of praying for you? Is anybody like that here? You'd raise your hand up and down, just up and down, up and down. Thank you, precious. I see your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Please pray for me. There's a question mark. I'm looking around. Anybody else? I'm going to give you another minute. Anybody else? Anybody at all? Father, you see this hand. You know every heart. How precious it is. Because I know what she's feeling. Because that was me. It takes courage. It takes humility to do that. Like John did. And like she did, I want to thank you for her trust and just letting me know that. I want to pray for her. Lord, you love her. You gave your life for her. You want her to know and to be settled and sure that she is your child and you are her father. Please help her today. I pray this in Jesus' name. One more question. Is there anybody here? And it's time for you to say, Lord, I surrender all. Would you please stand to your feet? Please stand to your feet. Everywhere, everybody to your feet. Everybody, if you will. But if you're here and you say, it's time for me to say, I surrender all. The altar is open. Would you come and kneel before the Lord? Not before men, but before the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. I'm all yours. I surrender all. Anybody here like that? I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I've never done that. That took me a couple years as a Christian before I came to that place. Are you there? Have you surrendered your all to Jesus? Do you need to? Would you like to today? God bless you, sister. Anybody else? Maybe you'd just like to sit down right where you are right where you are and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future, and I want you to know I'm all yours. And you gave me the greatest gift I've ever received. You received the, 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 I've experienced the greatest miracle anyone could ever experience, the miracle of salvation. And I want to give you a gift. I know it's not much. It's just me, Lord. But here am I.
Take me. Use me. Send me. Change me. Is that your prayer? Father, thank you for singling Peter out and James and John that day. And every person here who's saved and knows they're saved have been singled out, not just for salvation, but for service, to follow you so that we might all become fishers of men. So we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. If you'd sit down just for a moment, please. One more blessing today. And uh, Lauren, if you'll come forward. This is Lauren Creed.